Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. It's time for our uh, scripture reading this morning. Our scripture reading will be taken from the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23. Amen. Did I say Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23? And I'll be reading that in your hearing. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, uh, 19 verse 23 says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading and to the hearing and the doing of his word. Amen. Amen. Well, before I begin this morning, I'm going to kneel once more, if you please just bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, I ask that you would uh, use me this morning, Lord, that I would not hinder the blessing you have in store as we explore your word and as we learn more of you. Um, Father, I ask that um, we would positively react to the call that you give each and every one of us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this has um, <clears throat> most certainly been a big week for major headlines in the news. Um, many things that should uh, encourage us uh, most definitely to be praying more, uh, especially for those that uh, had family that experienced loss during this past week. Um, it's also a reminder for us, though, that we are nearing the time of the end. Uh, these, these bad news headlines are coming again and again with uh, more frequency. Um, and we know that uh, now is the time that we should be putting our hope and our trust in God. Uh, what we're seeing are the results of a sinful world. Decisions that uh, are being made now or have been made some time ago that we are seeing the results of. Uh, the results of bad choices, the results of living lives that are contrary to God's guidance is, uh, is, is what we see. There's um, something about those headlines, however, in, uh, that came up after the board meeting we had this week, a little discussion afterwards, and um, at least what I gathered from it, and that is there's very little concern for these matters until it gets closer to our home. We had a major event that hit our nation, and when that happens, we cringe, and we go to church uh, where we didn't think maybe we should before, or we weren't going to. Uh, we begin to take better account for our lives, all that is, until before long it's back to business as usual. Uh, this week, a large group of people lost their lives in a short amount of time, and a young boy in a most unfortunate way. However, many other places all over the world experience that kind of loss on a regular basis, far more regular than we do. Where are our emotions uh, for those people during that time? Where is our sense of a need for church and prayer and time with God? It's happening all of the time, not just when it happens close by. Now, I'm not suggesting that we dwell on uh, negative things. Uh, all the time or more than we do necessarily, but I am suggesting that we should consider the dangers of becoming a people that are unaware of the condition of our world, that we're so disconnected from what happens on a regular basis that we're not even aware how it can affect us. I'm going to give you another current event scenario that isn't as gloomy, but will hopefully will make the point for you. Just this week, Microsoft purchased a professional social networking company called LinkedIn for $26.2 billion. Now, many of you may have seen that headline, but you probably said, so what, who cares? Right? Does this seem like an exciting headline for most of you? Not really, right? You don't care that much about technology and you see, uh, you know, big deals happen all the time. Besides, I use Facebook or Instagram anyway, so it doesn't really affect me. 
But while those things might be true, uh, the, the evidence as to why we're in danger comes when we fail to realize just how much money that really is. We see 26.2 and our brains uh, fail to go much farther than just the couple of digits that it is. Now I know that you said billion and then there's an illion in there, so it's probably a lot, more than just a few numbers. But I'm going to give you some examples of the difference between billion and million, just so you understand. We know that when you go from one dollar to a million dollars, whoa, that's a lot of money. But what about when you go from one million to a billion? Let me give you some examples. If you were given one million dollars but were told that you had to spend a thousand dollars every single day of that money until you ran out, that was the only criteria that you had, you know how long it would take you? Three years. Three years of spending one thousand dollars every single day to get rid of one million dollars. You think you're up for that challenge? How about this? If you were given a billion dollars in the same scenario, spending a thousand dollars a day, now how long will it take you? About three thousand years. Three thousand years. Here's another. If somebody stood over a very big hole, and it'd have to be very big, in the ground, and they were instructed to drop a $20 bill into that hole every single minute, day and night. It would take them 95 years. Every single minute you're dropping a $20 bill into a hole, it would take you 95 years to get rid of a billion dollars. One billion. In this last example that I'll give you, if you had a million dollars in thousand dollar bills, it would make a stack that's about eight inches high. I'm going to estimate that to be eight inches right there, from the pulpit to there. Eight inches, that's a million dollars. One billion dollars in the same uh, denomination, thousand dollar bills, it would make a stack 115 feet higher than the Washington Monument, which is 555 feet tall. This week's headline was that Microsoft bought LinkedIn for $26.2 billion and the majority of the world said, eh, who cares? We have no idea how much money 26.2 or 20, sorry, yeah, $26.2 billion really is. It's an insane amount of money, an incredible amount of money. And for things that for most of us were not on LinkedIn because it's for professionals, we say, doesn't really affect me. We've lost track of what things have value, what their value is. Um, how much is a million and how much is a billion? Most of us don't even have a budget that we work with with our own personal finances. Some people don't even regularly look at their own bank account. Many people don't even plan for retirement. They just assume that when it comes that time, and they'll be taken care of. The money will be there. As a people, we are out of touch in a very, very big way. And here's where it really gets us. Because we are out of touch as to what has value and what doesn't, we tend to do the same thing with our spiritual lives. We kind of stick it in that bag of unknown. We know that we're supposed to read the Bible just like we know we're supposed to save money. But I've got this thing and I've got the other thing to do before I can get to that. You know, I've got to buy this other thing before I can go ahead and save that money or before I'm going to take time to budget it. I need to spend some other time doing something else. Or I should go to church this week, but I'm so tired because I've worked so long to pay for the house that's far too large for me. Or the car that's way nicer than I can afford. We can also apply it to the opposite of scenarios. Maybe we can say, I have so little and I can't waste time in prayer or Bible study or going to church because I've got to work hard in order to provide for my family or for myself to get out of this bad situation. This morning we're going to look at several scenarios in the Bible uh, that should help us get a right perspective back in our lives as to the value of things, but most importantly the value of right spirituality. 
And all of these scenarios, these stories that we're going to look at, have to do with the callings of Jesus. Very similar to what we looked at in the adventure camp at Camp Alamisco. So we're primarily going to be in the book of Matthew. And you can begin to turn there if you would like. Matthew chapter 9. We'll also be looking in the book of uh, Luke later. But for now, Matthew chapter 9 is where we will start. Now, as you're turning there, um, I know many of you are familiar with um, some of these stories. And uh, a big part of the stories that we're going to look at are a type of people that they were known as publicans. Some of you may know what a publican is, but for those of you that do not, a publican was a tax collector for the Roman government. Essentially what happened was that uh, when an, an, an enemy army came in and invaded a country and took it over, overpowered it, that new leadership would um, bid out or they would farm out tax collecting to other contractors. And then those contractors would hire locals to make the actual collections. So somebody would come into our country, they would take it over and they would give bids out. You know, hey, who can collect all this tax for us? We don't want to do it ourselves and spend all of our time and resources, but you tell us how much you'll take out of the taxes and how much you're going to give us and we'll give it to the best bid. So those contractors would hire locals and what was happening in this case, what we see uh, the story we're about to get into, is that Jews were hired to collect from other Jews. Now, if that happened here in America, some other country came in and uh, invaded and they did this same thing, they farmed it out, and you knew that it was an, an American that was working for another country that was collecting tax to give to basically the enemy, how would that make you feel about that person? Traitor. Uh, you're not going to like him all that well, more than likely. Uh, William Barclay wrote this regarding the taxation practices of that time. Uh, some of this may sound familiar to us in our time, but not, not quite. He says, there was a purchase tax on all that was bought and sold. There was bridge money to be paid when a bridge was crossed, road money to be paid when main roads were used, harbor dues to be paid when a harbor was entered, market money to be paid when market was used, town dues to be paid when a traveler entered a walled town. If a man was traveling on a road, he might have to pay a tax for using the road, a tax on his cart, on its wheels, on its axle, and on the beast which drew the cart. There was also a tax on crossing rivers and on ships. These people were considered sellouts by their countrymen, and they were hated by most because they were often so untrustworthy and took so much more money than was actually required just so they could line their own pockets and left them hated. If money was something that you valued greatly and you wanted more of it, not caring who you trampled over to get it, then a publican might be the right job for you. Among those publicans, among those types of people, was Matthew himself. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9 says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. It takes one verse to describe this encounter between Jesus and Matthew. Just one verse. Matthew had the money. We know because of his job title there that he had the life. He had almost everything that he could ever need until, that is, he met Jesus. Now, there must have been something special about Jesus that inspired him enough, he had enough confidence to stand up and follow him. There's a wonderful book called The Desire of Ages, and in chapter 28 of that book, it tells the story of Matthew. And from that we gather, we understand that Matthew had heard some of Jesus' teachings before. He had heard some of his presentations or some of his sermons. He had recognized, based on those presentations, that what he was doing was wrong. And he wanted to reach out to Jesus, but he had a dilemma. And that is, Matthew only understood these teachers the way that he saw his local rabbis. And that was, uh, they were closed off, uh, they were unapproachable. 
And so he wanted to learn more about basically how do I change this life? How do I change from what I am, from what is wrong, to what is right? But he didn't feel as if he could approach Christ. He wanted counsel, but he felt like it was impossible to get it. So imagine this with me. Say you're Matthew, you're there in your office, you're doing your work, your horrible work that everybody hates you for. You've got a lot of money, but you know you're not supposed to be doing it, and you don't know how to get out. But then, the person that you've been wanting to see, wanting to talk to, comes right to your office. I mean, of all the offices, of all the desks to go to, comes to yours, the person that has been wanting something, and says... Follow me. We can see it might have been pretty, you know, sort of easy because it was something that he wanted for Matthew to just leave it, to drop it and go. What a wonderful Savior we have that comes and gives him that offer. Now, the way that the scripture reads, there was no hesitation in Matthew. He didn't tidy up his office. He didn't wait, make one last deposit in the bank. He didn't grab an extra coat for the road. He just dropped everything and he followed Jesus right out of his office. Wherever Jesus was going that afternoon, that very minute, Matthew was going with him. Incredible. So let's look what happens in the very next verse. Verse 10. It reads, Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Matthew's decision to drop his worldly life and follow Christ resulted in others meeting Christ too. What a novel thought that is. That for somebody to make a decision to follow Christ would result in other people seeing something in them and perhaps be inclined to make the same decision. Because of what Matthew did, they were able to have a meal there at Matthew's home, and the gospel seeds were planted in those people's lives. The Desire of Ages tells us that later, when the Holy Spirit uh, fell on all the people, that there were many that were there in that house that day that then later made a decision to follow God. Now, there's two more examples we need to get to, so we're going to move on to the next one. Still here in the book of Matthew, but this time in chapter 19. Chapter 19, we're going to begin in verse 16. Chapter, nine, or, uh, chapter 19, rather, beginning in verse 16. Another familiar story, but one we're going to go ahead and read through and then pick apart. This is how it reads. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So uh, he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Continues in verse 19, Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23 kind of sums it up. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That rich young ruler had a similar draw to Jesus that Matthew did. He too had, uh, had heard uh, Jesus speak before. They, they both had wealth, but they knew that there was something missing in their lives. There was something that needed filled, and they saw it in Christ. Like many still do today, that young ruler was seeking assurance for salvation. Now, he went there, he sought the master, he sought the one that he needed to, and Jesus laid out for him the importance of keeping the commandments, which the young ruler was completely in favor of. Notice, uh, Jesus didn't cut down the commandments, he was in favor of them. But when Jesus called for a closer walk, 
a lifestyle change that the young ruler had not yet made, it was too much for him. He had followed God's teachings up to where he wanted or where he could or maybe where he had been instructed before to where he was comfortable. But beyond that, when he saw that there was yet something else that could be done to uh, benefit his life, to ensure that salvation, there was no way. He couldn't do it. Couldn't give it up. Jesus' words to his disciples was it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Hard, yes, but not impossible. Let's look at this next example, this time in the book of Luke, chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, you can turn there with me. Luke chapter 19. We're going to begin in verse 1. Luke chapter 19 and verse 1, another familiar story. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short Stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Before we read, Jesus said, It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Was Zacchaeus rich? We know it must not have been an easy thing for, uh, of a decision for him to make. But despite that, he did it. He was able to make the right decision and follow Jesus. Notice these similarities between Matthew, the young ruler, and Zacchaeus. Number one, they were all rich, right? Well, they were at least in a position to be so. But more than that, they all wanted to see Jesus. They all wanted to know more from Him. They wanted that, and they wanted it in a big way. Just like in the story of Matthew, Jesus comes along the way of the one who wants to see Him, and He stops, and He addresses them, and He leads them. Similar thing, imagine this with me. You're Zacchaeus, you want to see Jesus. You, you want out of the life here he is, he's nearby, and there's a huge crowd, you can't even see him. So he runs ahead just to get in a tree so he could even just, if he could just see him. And perhaps there's something there. Perhaps there's hope, perhaps there's life. Apart from what he is currently living. And as Jesus walks by, he stops and he looks directly at him. Looks directly, directly at you if you're imagining yourself to be Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus? Come down from there. I'm going to come to your house today. I'm the one that you have desperately wanted to know more of. I'm going to walk to you. I'm going to find you out, though you're up high in a tree, somewhere difficult that, to usually be seen, and I'm going to call you by name and give you the things that you desire because what you desire is pure and good. Those accusations that were immediately thrown out about this Zacchaeus guy. Everybody there gives you the evidence that they hated him. He's a sinner. He's a sinner. The, the, the other Jews looked at these uh, publicans um, as ceremonially unclean. You couldn't touch the staff that the, that, the, uh, uh, that the publicans carried. 
uh, because it was unclean. They even pushed the limits uh, of, of, of what you could do to try to avoid these uh, taxes. And they even allowed you to lie, according to the Jewish custom, so you could avoid some of those taxes because they were so hated. Desperate for Jesus, he waits. And there Jesus comes and he calls him by name. And he goes to his house. The, the crowd there accuses him. But, but as we understand it, again, from uh, looking more deeply at it, the statement that Zacchaeus makes is to the entire crowd. He says it publicly. You know, it says he's speaking to Jesus, but they're st still there in the crowd. You can kind of pick it up when you read the words of Jesus. He's addressing kind of both of them there. He says, whoever I've offended here, I'm going to give you back fourfold of whatever I took. I'm giving half my stuff away plus four times back whatever I took from anybody made a big public statement. He was making right the wrongs that he committed. What did that do for him and his house? Jesus said it brought them salvation. Brought them salvation. We look at the decision that Matthew made. Matthew says, I, I, I'm going to drop it all. I'm going to follow you. And then he has this dinner party at his house. And his friends are there to hear the words of Christ. Because of this, the, the decision that he made. We come to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus makes some pretty big decisions to go and follow Christ and to make right the wrongs he has committed. And it's not just salvation for him, but it's for his entire house because of his decisions. Do the things that we decide to do affect other people? In a huge way. And what happens when we make the decisions to follow God? It can do the same for everybody else around us. So, okay, we've talked about current headlines, knowing the value of things. Uh, Microsoft buying LinkedIn, and now these stories of disciples and other people following God. What do these have to do with each other? We are not phased by billion-dollar deals anymore. For the most part, as a people, we are foolish with money, and we take little value in much of anything. You know what our problem is? Our problem is that we are rich. We are filthy rich and we don't even know it or maybe we don't even care. We are as rich as the two-timing Matthew, as the learned young ruler, or the rich Zacchaeus. We are these rich individuals and we don't even know it, or maybe we don't even care. We have literally turned our prosperity into a joke by naming some of the most annoying issues that we face as first world problems. I can't hear the TV over the sound of the chips crunching in my mouth. I don't know which of my pairs of shoes I should pair with this current outfit that I'm wearing. Besides that, I have this other huge problem, I've got more clothes than I have hangers for. First world problem. My laptop is dying and the charger is in the other room. With one pillow on my bed, it's too low, and with two pillows, it's too high. My diamond earrings keep scratching my iPhone. I can't open this bag of chips because my fingers are too greasy from eating the last bag of chips. While the rest of the war world is at war, as they are starving, as people can't even find water to drink, these are the biggest problems we face on a regular basis. First world problems. We are rich, friends. Incredibly rich. Maybe richer than the rich young ruler or even Zacchaeus, who could pay all of that money back to those people. But there is something that Matthew, that young ruler, and even Zacchaeus had that we still lack. They really wanted to know Jesus. They really wanted to know him. And what it did for them is it brought them, it made them search him out. 
and made them look for him wherever they could. And when they got close and there was a big crowd of people, there were some mean church members that were in the way of seeing Jesus, they made a way around it. When there were people that were ugly to them and they were calling them names because of the decisions they were making, they said, but I'm going to make them still. They wanted to see Jesus. And when Matthew and Zacchaeus were offered those next steps to take, they took them. I pray we're not like that young ruler who, 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 who when he says, you know what, I, I know I need something more, I know I need something more, but then when we're shown it, says, can't do that. Can't give up that next step. But instead we follow the example of Matthew and Zacchaeus. This is what is said of Matthew. It says, there was no hesitation, no questioning, no thought of the lucrative business to be exchanged for poverty and hardship. It was enough for him that he was to be with Jesus, that he might listen to his words and unite with him in his work. To be with Jesus was enough for Matthew. Is it enough for you? The quote continues to say this, and this is all from Desire of Ages, page 273, if you want to look it up later. When Jesus bade Peter and his companions to follow him, immediately they left their boats and nets. Some of these disciples had friends dependent on them for support, but when they received the Savior's invitation, they did not hesitate and inquire, how shall I live and sustain my family? They were obedient to the call, and when afterward Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? They could answer with what? Nothing. We never lacked Jesus. That's from Luke 22. How dedicated are you to Jesus? Are you dedicated enough to follow His leading wherever and in whatever that may be? Or are you too busy with your first world problems to even realize that there is a Savior calling you by your name, wanting to lead you to a better life? Maybe we feel like we're lost. Maybe we feel like we can't even get to Jesus, like He's too far away. But if we call on Him, he will come to us just like He did for Matthew, just like He did for Zacchaeus, just like He does for every single person that wants a closer walk with Him. But we've got to want it. We have to want it. I encourage you to take the next few moments that we have in prayer to ask God to prioritize or to reprioritize your life, to put Him first, following His leading, to be the type of person that makes the right decisions that will see your friends and your family making the same ones and to be saved as well. Let's bow our heads for a time of prayer and then I'll close with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are um, oftentimes stunned by the headlines we see of large groups of people being murdered and uh, children uh, being killed. And, and Father, we cringe and we hold our own children tight. But it's only for a time. And then it's back to business as usual. And Father, we... We, we, we fail to remember that uh, this world is not our home. And the things we strive for here, the things we work uh, tirelessly for here, um, are of such little value. Father, at the same time, uh, we, we, we misappropriate value and, and, and we tend uh, to put our spiritual needs uh, far lower than they ought to be. Father, I ask that you would help us to recognize that every single day is the day we need to seek you. Every single day is the day we need to pray first, to study first, and then do things uh, after. 
God, I ask that you would give us the desire like Matthew, like that young ruler and like Zacchaeus had, to seek you out, to ask, Lord, what else might be done? How else might I serve you? How can I come closer? And Father, give us the courage and the dedication that Matthew and Zacchaeus had to make the decision to change. Lord, they might have had lucrative lives, but they gave it up. They gave up the world because they saw there was little value in it. And Father, uh, even later, uh, when, when, when Christ uh, returned to visit the disciples and they were out on the boat and, uh, and He helped to fill their nets, their work life was, was flashed right before them. Again, they, they were back to business as usual. They could be fishermen again. But again, they dropped it all and they followed you. Father, give us that dedication that no matter what comes in front of us, we stick to you. We put aside the world and we follow you. We reach out for you. We feed your lambs. We feed your sheep. We guide them. Father, make us into the disciples, into the apostles that you have uh, called us to be. It's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand together as we sing the closing hymn, 224. We'll sing the first, fourth, and fifth verses. for the benediction. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your wonderful word that gives us uh, direction for the time that we are living in right now. 
Father, forgive us that if we have failed to see that we are rich and increased with goods. Father, help us to have the right attitude. Help us to have the right desires, and that is to seek you first. Father, uh, make this the priority in our life. And Lord, as we make the decisions to follow you, to do what you have called us to, Lord, that those around us would be inspired to do the same. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.